The nightmares woke me up again that night. I shot up like a bullet, soaked in sweat, choking back a scream. The men around there had enough night terrors as it was. They didn't need me adding to the noise. I looked around the dark tent at the sleeping faces. At least I didn't wake anyone else up with my shell shock. Knowing sleep would elude me for at least an hour, I grabbed my pack of smokes and limped out to take a piss. The night air was hot and sticky, clinging to my body and making me sweat. I was surprised I even had to go to the bathroom with how much I was sweating. That's how Vietnam really got you. If the VC didn't kill you, the moisture did. You were either getting rained on non-stop and catching jungle rot, or you were sweating away more water than you could ever drink. And that's how I got benched in the medical tent in the first place. I spent too much time in wet boots and was rewarded with open sores and a nurse named Madge. Madge had a snaggle tooth like you wouldn't believe, and lacked the gentle touch and beautiful features that you'd prefer to see looking over you when you wake up in medical. I saw some of the lookers the other guys got, and let me tell you, I got cheated. After a couple weeks of not-so-tender love and care from Madge, my feet were feeling better, but I was still in no shape to fight. I could barely limp to the latrine without crying from the pain. I started my tour of duty slinging fire through the jungle at communists, and now is just another potato in a medical tent. Some American hero I turned out to be. I used to feel like a dragon. The weight of the canisters felt like wings furled tightly against my back, and the wand in my hand felt like an open maw spewing flames upwards of 60 feet. I could destroy anything with that fire, and the heat would barely touch me. I was in control. I was untouchable. An agent of freedom sent to burn away the enemies of democracy. Then, Milai happened. Sure, we had done terrible things before. That's war. My friends and I had to kill dozens of times, but not like that. Not so carelessly, not so brutally. My M9 felt differently after that day. The canisters felt more like shackles than wings, holding me down instead of lifting me up. The flames felt hotter too. Like the heat alone could suffocate me the way it choked out the VC in their rat nests. I finished up my business in the latrine and sat on the stoop to light up. The smell was awful that close to the john. But it was only marginally worse than the smell my feet were giving off. And I needed a place to sit that wasn't in that awful tent full of sad sacks and cripples. Sitting there in the night with a cigarette in hand... I almost felt like a person again. I took a long drag and stared out into the jungle, reminiscing about nights like this from before the war. I always had trouble sleeping, so I used to sneak out on the roof of my parents' house with some of my dad's cigarettes and look out into the woods behind our old tool shed. I'd stare into the trees for what felt like hours and just listen to the sounds of the forest the world behind my house felt so big, like I could walk into the woods and never come back. I used to dream about trekking into the forest and living a life of daring adventure, far away from the humdrum small town life that had kept me on roofs, instead of in the wild where I belonged. And seeing my chance to escape a life of monotony and enter a life of adventure and meaning, I enlisted right out of high school and was shipped off to Charlie Company a couple of months later. I quickly found the horrible new monotony of war, and my nights became filled with terrors and the foreign sounds of the jungle. It was a lateral move at best. A cool breeze drifted out of the bush and sent a strange chill down my neck. Something felt wrong in the air. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and I scanned the trees for enemies. Trusting your gut keeps you alive in the jungle, and my gut was screaming that there was something out there in the darkness looking right back at me. 
I put a hand over my cigarette to hide the glow and stared deeper into the trees. Time stopped and the world around me slipped away when I noticed the light. Around twenty feet into the tree line, I saw a small flame waltzing through the air in slow, carefree circles. I felt a strange pull in my chest as my eyes followed its orbit. The alarm drained out of me, and I realized that this little light wasn't a threat. There was nothing to fear. I lowered my hand from in front of my smoke and waved the cigarette through the air, mimicking the light's lazy circuit. The mysterious flame seemed to burn a little brighter as my own flame matched its movements. The glow became more entrancing. I put my cigarette out in the dirt and stood, never taking my eyes off of that little fox fire. The pain in my feet fell away with the rest of the world, and I floated into the jungle. Cold water soaked through the bandages on my feet and branches battered me as I followed the light. Every time I started getting close, it would disappear and leave me alone in the darkness. I would stand dumbly and stare off in the jungle and wait for it to reappear. Sometimes, it would be gone for minutes at a time, and the pain would return to my feet. I'd feel clarity returning, and consider going back to the camp, when the flame would just rekindle deeper in the trees and beckon me further. Now this pattern I repeated countless times. The light would draw me in and disappear, only to reappear fifty feet away and dance through the air again. I kept following and forgot about the war. I forgot about the medical tent and Madge, about my jungle rot and my dead allies. I was back in high school, living out my dream of adventuring into the woods behind my house. It felt good. It felt right. The deeper I waded into the jungle, the more a cold chill started to take me. I felt like a walking corpse, shambling my way through the darkness toward a light that seemed to promise something greater than the hand I had been dealt. Second chance perhaps a new life, a special kind of heaven that even fewer believed in than the normal kind, when I got a special kind of hell instead. The next time the light disappeared, I felt heat, immense suffocating heat that threatened to melt away the deathly chill that had wrapped itself around me on my jungle trek. I turned around and found myself face to face with me lie. Daylight and inferno conspired to blind me as I relieved my lowest moment. I felt my flamethrower in hand and saw the stream of fire spewing out of it, coating huts and napalm. Women and children streamed out of their burning homes and were met with gunfire. Mothers shielded their infants as bullet holes peppered their backs, only to watch with their dying breaths as their babies too were shot. And I dropped the flamethrower and covered my eyes with my hands, like a kid hiding from the monster under his bed. The heat vanished and I was left in the darkness with tears streaming down my face. I sank to the ground and sobbed, deep, shuddering sobs that rocked my whole being. And I don't know how long I sat there, curled up on the ground with my head in my hands, but the tears eventually stopped, and the numbness swept over me. I took a few deep breaths to calm myself and looked back up, half expecting to be in the medical tent waking up from a night terror, but I wasn't. Darkness and jungle sounds surrounded me, and I felt the oppressive humidity blanketing me again. The chill was gone and I was alone in the trees. I looked around, wondering if I could see the burnt out shells of huts and the charred remains of their inhabitants. But there were just trees. And I asked myself, had I somehow walked all the way back, 
There was no way. Milai was miles away, and I couldn't have walked there in a single night, especially not with jungle rot. The thought of my feet brought the pain back in full force. They were cold and wet and on fire. I tried to stand, but the pain was too much and I fell back down. A foolish walk of mine was going to set my recovery back another couple of weeks at least. I couldn't believe I had spent who knows how long chasing ghost lights through the jungle. I didn't know how I'd get back. I'd taken so many twists and turns and had no way of retracing my steps. I thought about my vision. About Nilai. He had told us before we went that everyone in the area would be considered VC, or VC sympathizers. We expected to find a full militia when we arrived there shortly after dawn. But instead, we found a village of mostly women, children, and the elderly. They were making breakfast. Lieutenant Callie ordered us to round them up and search the village. We didn't find any VC. We barely found any weapons. There were only three or four guns in the whole place. Callie didn't care. See, he ordered us to start shooting. I choked back a new volley of tears and stuffed the memory back down. I shouldn't have been giving it any more power while I was awake as it held enough sway over me in my sleep. I needed to focus on getting back to camp, the Charlie Company. I almost threw up when I thought about the men that I called friends, about what we had done in that village. I was almost glad for the jungle rot taking me out of commission less than a week after. Every day I spent with Charlie Company since the massacre hurt like hell. I couldn't stop thinking about the bodies about the looks of terror frozen on their faces, about the unbuttoned blouses and missing pants. I had no way of knowing who had done what that day, and that almost made it worse. Any of us could be a monster. Hell, all of us were monsters. I'd waited for weeks after that day for some shred of news to come back to us from home. For a newspaper article, or radio broadcast, or something that would decree and condemn our heinous actions. But nothing came. Some of the men from Charlie Company came to visit me in the medical tent after a couple weeks, and I asked them if they had heard anything in the news about what we did. They told me no, that some higher-ups were keeping it a secret, and thank God because their girls back home would leave them for sure if they had heard what had happened. And they laughed about it. They laughed like it was some wild Friday night where they got a little too drunk and went home with the wrong girl at the bar, like they had slept off the hangover and moved on, thankfully that no one knew that they stepped out on their misses. <laughs> like they could ever wash that blood off of their hands. I told Madge not to let any more visitors see me after that. I couldn't believe that they laughed about it, that they were okay with hiding what we had done, and I definitely couldn't believe that the higher-ups were brushing it under the rug. Almost 500 civilians brutalized and executed for no reason, and they wanted to cover it up, and I was benefiting from that cover-up. I was pulled from my despair by the flame's sudden reappearance. One minute I was staring into the darkness, the next minute I was looking at the same light floating in the same circle, like it had been there the whole time and it was waiting for me to notice it. I stood up faster than I should have been able to move, invigorated by my quarry. They had led me out there and shown me my sins. There had to be a reason. I started following it as quickly as possible. I needed to catch it, to know what it wanted. And this time, it didn't disappear. It simply kept its distance as it led me through the jungle towards some unknown destination. As I followed the flame, I thought about my sins, about the sins of my company 
about all the evil that had been committed in this godforsaken war, fighting for my godforsaken country. Why was I even there? What was the point of it all? Had I really started this whole journey because I wanted a little bit of action? Because I wanted to live a little? I thought about how I deserved to be brought to justice. How we all deserve to be brought to justice. But we might never be. I thought my superiors who would rather hide their sins than atone for them. I thought about how I had done the same thing, hiding in the medical tent so I didn't have to look my accomplices in the eye, so I could lock myself away from my sins. That light led me to the last place I ever thought it would, back to the camp. I hobbled after it as it floated right up to the armory and danced around the door. The flame lowered itself onto the lock as I approached and I watched the metal melted away under its heat. The lock fell off, and the door swung open. I took the last few steps towards the light, and it moved toward me, sending white-hot pain across my whole being as it passed into my chest. Understanding finally dawned on me when I saw my flamethrower hung up on the wall. I realized that I was burning for what I had done, that I deserved to burn for what I had done. And soon, all of Charlie Company was burning too. <laughs>